So all these years of going into the woods, I've uh, gone into the woods thinking that uh, that I had these great binoculars. I've walked into the woods with some mid-level three to five hundred dollar binoculars. I had a pair of uh, uh, Nikon Monarchs that I thought were great 8x56s and get out there and all I knew was that they were a good binocular. And then I had a pair of loopholes. I forget which model they were, but again, I'd walk out there because I'd spent decent money on them. I thought that they were great. And I never thought of my friends who had higher end binoculars that were spending twelve, fourteen hundred dollars, twenty eight hundred dollars on binoculars. I never thought that there was any necessity for that. And I'd spent many, many hours in the woods. In fact, it's one of my great passions is to spend time out, out, out there hunting. And I'm hunting and I'm looking and I can always see everything adequately. And then a few years ago, two years actually, I was in Wyoming, and I was sitting with my friend Chris Kreitz and we were hunting um, in Wyoming for antelope and mule deer. And we were sitting on the hillside one morning. It was right in the first thing in first light, right in the morning. We're sitting in a hillside, side by side, looking for antelope. And he's spotting things that I'm really not spotting. And, uh, and he says, hey, why don't you take a look at these? And he had a pair of high-end Swarovskis. And he said, why don't you take a look at these? And I, I put those up to my eyes, and it was like I saw something I never saw before. The amount of light that was captured, the clarity and the detail that I was able to see was unbelievable. It was like I had never looked through a pair of binoculars before. It was like I was looking with my naked eye prior to that. And I could see details on sage bushes that were, you know, five and six hundred yards away. I mean, I could pick up anything that was out there in this large plain, this large sage flat in front of us. And I recognized at that moment that although I thought I could see well before that with my other two pair of binoculars, I really didn't know what a good pair of binoculars were like, and I had no idea just how good you could see when you're looking through good glass. And I think often, as we're looking through the subject matter of how do we deal with one another, and how do we deal with preferences, and how do we deal with sin in each other's lives, how do we rightly minister to one another, I think sometimes in our walk, we're looking through cheap glass. And we don't see things as they really are. In fact, sometimes because our glass is fogged up, we're attacking people rather than ministering to people. Sometimes we're attacking people when it's an issue of preference and not an issue of sin. And we're coming down and confronting them like it would happen to be sin. And then other times when it... Well, that's not good. Other times when it is sin... This is going to be a problem. Other times when it is sin, we ignore it and we call it love. And we act like ignoring sin in one another's life is really loving each other because that's what the modern church has taught us. Oh, don't confront sin. Let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. Well, I know this. God works through the Holy Spirit in our lives. God works through the scriptures as we read them. God works individually in our prayer life. And God works through other believers in our lives to encourage us and to build us up. And just like that moment when I picked up that pair of good glass, and looked out there and saw things I've never seen, sometimes as we mature and grow, the light comes on. And we start to see things more clearly than we ever have before. And sometimes when that happens, it becomes a very good thing. Because we see things clearly and we start reacting properly to what we've learned and to the application that comes with the scriptures that we've learned. But sometimes when we see clearly for the first time, it builds a bit of pride in the heart. And sometimes it goes further to a point of just arrogance and to pump, to where we think we're above and better than those that are struggling or having different issues in their life than what we're having, or have different preferences than what we have, and rather than ministering to them, we actually look down on them and criticize and hurt them. Anybody ever experience any of that in your Christian walk? Yeah, we've been down that road. Maturing Christians not only see things rightly, but rather than just looking to see what they see in others, they're constantly before a holy God saying, God, search my heart and show me what you're seeing in my heart. Because you've got, you got to understand, God's got the ultimate pair of binoculars. He sees perfectly into the depth of our heart. Without mistake, without error in judgment, 
without any flaw. He looks into the depth of our heart, and if we're open to having him minister to us and show us, he will show us exactly where we stand. Then we can be properly ready to discern in each other's lives how to minister to each other, whether we're dealing with preferences or whether we're dealing with sin. The last three chapters of the book of Romans has dealt with application in the believer's life. Verse 11, doctrine. The last three has dealt with application, in particularly, in how do we deal with immature and mature believers and how do we minister to one another when it's preferences and how do we minister to one another when it's sin. Today we're going to continue down that path and we're going to look at Romans 15, verses 7 through 13. And we're going to look at your all. So let's pray. And then we're going to look at these scriptures. <laughs> Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Lord, that we can come before you. And we can minister in the power of the Holy Spirit that you have placed within us. And we can minister to one another in truth, in love, with gentleness, kindness. And yet we can still exhort one another when necessary. Lord, I pray that we would take an active role in one another's lives, loving each other, and truly living the shared life that you've called us to live. You've not called us anywhere to live an isolated life as a Christian. You've not called us anywhere to be on an island as a Christian. You've called us to live in a community of believers that you place us in according to your word. Lord, I pray as a local church, that we'd be serious about our journey together and that we would love and walk with one another through the times that are difficult, through the times that are great, through the struggles we face and the situations we encounter. And Lord, that we would experience victory as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're welcome. Verse 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Therefore, because of everything that's come before it, therefore, because of what we've learned on how to relate to one another in, order, in issues of preference, how we relate with one another in issues of sin, how we relate with one another with different gifts, different talents, different abilities, how we relate to one another when it comes to different backgrounds, different ethnicity, welcome, it says, one another. Welcome. Literally accept one another. Now understand, the Roman church was not a church that didn't have problems. It didn't have issues going on. You had the Gentile believers who had come to Christ out of pagan religions and out of worshiping idols. And there were those who had matured and those who hadn't. And they were having their differences. But they were also having differences with the Jews who had come to know Jesus Christ in which there were immature and mature believers. And there were issues between them. They had totally different backgrounds, totally different history, totally different everything. Just like in this room, we have different backgrounds, different experiences, different situations we face, different gifting, different efforts we've given, different ability, and different preferences that are okay and are not sinful. And it says, welcome, accept, take to oneself. Welcome one another. And here's the standard. As Christ has welcomed you. Have you spent any time recently thinking about how Christ has welcomed you? He's welcomed us as sinners by grace. He's welcomed us, according to Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners. He's accepted us based upon his finished work and not based upon anything we've done or haven't done. He's welcomed us by his powerful hand when we were undeserving of any such benefit. And he took us at great effort through shedding his blood a brutal death on a cross and making a payment for us that we could never make. That is how he welcomed us. Not when we were all cleaned up and had our act all together and were living perfect, righteous lives. He accepted us before, before we made an effort. Before we did anything. 
because we still can't do anything that would deem or merit us to enter the kingdom of heaven other than accepting by grace what he's offered, which is himself. He welcomed us and accepted us when we totally deserved hell. Now that's the standard with which we're supposed to welcome one another. And again, think about the context. The context is a mature brother or sister accepting the immature brother or sister according to what's gone on in the last three chapters. The context is us accepting each other when our preferences differ, when our backgrounds differ, when our situations differ, when our ethnicity differs. Accept one another as Christ welcomed or accepted us. I'm going to know. How are we doing in that area? How are we really accepting one another? Welcoming one another? Are we meeting up to the standard of grace that has been extended to us? Or are we, with a critical heart and spirit, as a result of pride, not receiving one another very well? I think it's something we have to look at. I think it's something we have to examine. Because we're called to welcome each other within the context of differences, within the context of different situations, circumstances, different preferences, we are called to extend grace one to another. That's the standard. Welcome one another as Christ welcomed you. And here's why. For the glory of God. Every Christian throughout the history of the world has had one purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. In the most mundane action of life, the most necessary and basic action of life, which is eating and drinking, even in those basic functions, were to glorify God. That is our sole purpose. We're to glorify God in everything. And in this scripture, we're to welcome, accept one another by extending grace to one another, all for the glory of God. We are agents of grace in each other's lives. And yet so often, within Christianity, when we hold different preferences, we end up attacking one another, hurting one another, putting one another down. And maybe we never verbalize it, but sometimes in our hearts, we view each other with a very critical spirit. Rather than extending the grace like Christ extended to us to one another. And I think we need to look at that very carefully. I've got a question for you, for those of you that are using the, the app that we now have and can do things with. Have I been guilty of judging others, forcing my views on one another when it comes to preferences? Have you been guilty of literally making wrong judgments on people's preferences? Yes, maybe, no. It's a struggle. I get that. It's a battle. I get that. Because in our mindset, we make choices because we believe they are the best choices. That's why we've decided to do whatever we wanted to do with our lives. It's because we believe it's the best and right choice. But sometimes, somebody's preference can be very different than ours, and neither is sin. It's okay. And sometimes, we have to say yes to this question. Because we've wrongly judged others in the area of preference. Now we know in the area of sin, did you get that bro? Yeah. What's your problem? In the area of sin, in the area of sin, understand we are called to judge one another. And you say, wait a minute, Matt. First Corinthians 5 very clearly speaks to actions. If you see me in sin, that is repetitive and unrepentant, you have a responsibility to come talk to me about it. I have a responsibility to come talk to you about it. How we do that is very important. 
If I see Wade in sin, I have a duty and a responsibility and love to walk up to Wade and say, Hey, Wade, I've observed this in your life. Will you get before God and see if this is the case? Take a look at it. Let me help you in this area. Not, you filthy, you filthy sinner, just knock it off. Get this out of your life. What's your friend? That, that doesn't get us anywhere. We're to come alongside each other and walk through it. But sometimes in the area of preferences, we attack one another. And it has to stop. Second point, your confirmation. In verse 8. Now I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. <clears throat> Scripture says a lot about history. A lot about what's happened. You see, God had a plan from before time that was going to be fulfilled. And his plan was first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. That was the plan. Historically, when we look at the Bible, going all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when he gave his promise, speaking here of the patriarchs, he gave his promise that the nation of Israel would be what? As many as the sand on the seashore. As many as the stars in the sky. He said that they would be a blessed nation, and what? That they would become a blessing to all the other nations if they live their lives rightly. God's promise cannot fail. His plan is not a plan that he just rolled the dice on, set in motion, and then said, we'll see what happens. He has a perfect plan. And it's being fulfilled in a perfect way. And we get a chance to participate. For I tell you that Christ became a servant. The word is diakonos. It's the word that we get the word deacon from. It simply means a servant. A waiter of tables. And it says that Christ became a servant in an ultimate fashion in order to serve the circumcised the nation of Israel. <laughs> to show God's truthfulness because there can be no lie in Him in order to confirm the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and in order that the Gentiles, the rest of us who are not Israel, might glorify God for His mercy. God came to the nation of Israel, used the nation of Israel throughout the entire Old Testament in order to be His vehicle of operation in the world to extend His grace to the entire world. Then Jesus came and Jesus established the church. And He established the church so that the church might now be His vehicle of operation in the world today to extend His grace to a lost and needy world. That's our role. It's not only to extend grace to one another, but it's to extend grace to all the world. In order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. In Matthew 15, verse 24 through 28, we get some insight into this. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Now, there's a great event that takes place here. There's a healing by Jesus Christ that takes place here that was very important to this woman. And she came to him by faith, recognizing that he is the Almighty God and can heal her daughter. But there's a bigger picture that's painted here. It's a picture of Israel and Gentile. Israel, whom Jesus Christ came to the circumcised to redeem, yet the Gentiles by that same grace and because of His mercy extended were able to enter into the kingdom. What an incredible statement. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. What a picture of mercy. Even the crumbs that fall to the ground will offer enough mercy 
What insight? And we, who are not Israel, which is the majority of us in this room, maybe all of us, I'm not sure, we have been extended mercy from God Almighty. And that's a great day. That's great news. Look at it in Romans uh, chapter 11 and verse 32. For God has consigned all to disobedience. Remember Romans chapter 3? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. For God has consigned all to disobedience. Why? That He might have mercy on all. All have sinned and therefore it is only by an act of His mercy that any of us can come to Him and inherit the kingdom of heaven. What an incredible, incredible act of grace. And how can we who have found that grace do anything other than extend grace to one another? But again, so often, we fall so short of that. We get caught up in petty, meaningless things rather than focusing on the kingdom work that He has given us to do. We get focused on our circumstance or on our situations or on somebody else's circumstance or their situations rather than asphyxiating our eyes on Jesus Christ and recognizing that He is the answer and extending grace one to another. Look at 1 John 2 and verse 2. He is the propitiation or the payment for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. His payment was enough for everyone. It is the only payment that could have been enough. We could have never done enough good works. We never could have been a good enough church member. We never could have got baptized enough. We never could have celebrated the Lord's Supper enough. There was nothing we could do enough in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus Christ spread His arms, died on a cross, shed His blood to make payment propitiation for us so that we might experience firsthand His mercy and His grace and inherit the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. That's the good news. That's the good news. Now this is a scripture that is often taken out of context by those who are not studying things in context and they'll tell you, see, but also for the sins of the whole world. Everybody's going to heaven. Everybody's going to enter the kingdom. His sin, his payment was good for all sins. It was good for all sin. And it was good for all sinners. But we must, by repentance and faith, accept the gift that's offered in order to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the whole story. And that's why we study expositorily, verse by verse, through sections or entire books of Scripture. So that we might see them in their context. Just like today's scripture, we need to understand it's in the context of preferences. It's in the context of how we view one another when it comes to preferential choices. So I have another question for you. Am I taking any actions that are causing another Christian to stumble? Remember the issue we looked at last week? Or two weeks ago, rather? Where Paul said... I think basically paraphrasing, there's nothing wrong with meat offered idols. I can eat anything if I give thanks to God. However, if it causes my brother to stumble, I will what? I will never eat meat again. In other words, he was going to put his brothers and sisters need or their good in front of his own freedom. And you see, we can use our freedom in many different ways. We can use it to glorify God and for kingdom work, or we can use it against kingdom work. We can even use our freedom and indulge it to where it becomes sin. And Paul was willing to set anything aside for the unity of the body and for the sake of his brother and sister. Am I taking any actions that are causing another Christian to stumble? We need to look at that constantly. And you say, but then how do I live my life if I always got to be thinking about what others and how others are going to react to what I do? That's loving one another. And if you don't know, and your brother and sister is ill-affected by your choice, by your freedom, and you recognize it, don't do it again then. Until they are at a point of maturity when they can handle it, or 
just stay away from it, whatever it is. Because we care for them more than we care for our preference. And we need to understand that. In verse 9 of our main text, it says, As it is written, Therefore I will, sing, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. That's a quote from Psalm 18 and verse 49. King David of the nation of Israel, clearly understanding the greater plan. I will praise you among the Gentiles. He understood his mission was not only to the nation of Israel. And sing to your name. It was a confirmation that the patriarchs and through them, mercy would be extended to all peoples. In verse 10, and again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That's Deuteronomy 32 and verse 43. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. That is Psalm 117 and verse 1. And this is a call to the Gentiles to praise the Lord, recognizing the mercy that has been extended to them. And then in verse 12, and again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. Isaiah 11 and verse 10. This is speaking of the future reign of Christ over Jews and Gentiles alike. And the fact that Jesse, the father of David, is the lineage through which Christ came. Very important to understand, this was always God's plan. We have been extended grace. We are to extend grace to one another. We've come in through mercy. We are to be merciful with one another. And we need to understand that is the standard we've been called to. So let me ask you another question. Can I trace any failings? Or are my preferences causing a breakdown in the unity of the body? Again. Are my preferences causing a breakdown? Just think, Veronica, if you had this loaded, you could answer. Are my preferences causing a breakdown in the unity of the body? That's a serious question. We have that kind of responsibility to one another. You know why this happens more than not? Why we sin against each other by not caring about our preferences and how it might affect others? Because we don't spend enough time with each other. We don't know what those preferences are. We don't share community life. Now you're doing that during the message when you should be paying attention. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Seriously, we don't get to know each other well enough to know where we can do damage to each other. And we don't get to know each other well enough to know how we can serve one another. That's body life. That's the shared life that we're to have one with another. And we need to take it seriously. Last section tonight. Your hope your hope. May the God of hope, is that not a great phrase? Literally, may the God of all hope, the God of complete hope, that's the God we serve. May the God of hope, of expectation, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. May the God of all hope, of all expectation, fill you to make literally full, to overflow, to be completed. May that God, the one who's of all hope, fill you with all joy. Now I've had a lot of discussions over the years with people about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And there have been extremes on both sides of what that means. There are those who live in fear of any experience of the Holy Spirit because they believe it will be out of control. And there are those who have gone to excess in what they have determined is a, a sign or, or some sort of a showing of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Here's what I know. The fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5, is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. You want to know if somebody's filled with the Spirit? That's what you're going to see. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's the indicator. Not rolling on the floor. That may be an indicator that you have epilepsy. But it's nowhere in the Scriptures an indication that you are Spirit-filled. And understand, I'm not mocking somebody, but it is a shortcoming in our system of belief today where we've said that the outward is a direct indication of the inward. 
Anybody else ever deceive somebody in their life? How'd your inward and your outward line up? Not too good in those instances, did they? You see, here's how it's going to show. Love, joy. Because my God of hope is going to what? Fill me with all joy. I think maybe my greatest, my second greatest pet peeve in all of Christianity is joyless Christians. We do great damage to the cause of Christ because we mope around and we bought into the woe is me, excuse making, blame shifting attitude of the rest of the world. If we serve a God who is sovereign and is in control of all things, then my circumstances are not by mistake. My situations are not by mistake or accident. They are sovereignly appointed so that I might glorify God in the midst of them. And if I believe what we've already learned in the book of Romans, what have we learned? All things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. All is all. It's all. And the same God who works for my good in all those situations and circumstances is the same God of all hope who has given me and blessed me with all joy. Here's the thing. Joy is not an emotion. It's not something I can conjure up inside by just saying, I'm going to be joyful now. It's an overflow of a filled life with the Holy Spirit. And to be joyless and call ourselves by the name of Christ is an oxymoron and it should not occur. And sometimes we do it. Now understand joy and happiness are not the same. I can be happy and joyful. I can be happy and not joyful. I can be sad and joyful. And I can be sad and not joyful. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit that comes from within because I know I've encountered the God of all hope. And it's simply a fruit of that relationship. May the God of all, of all hope fill you with all joy and peace. Love, joy, peace. Peace. What is your peace level like? Not this, but this. What is your peace level like? It's funny, I drove today like four times past the new, I didn't even know they made them anymore, but a new Volkswagen van. And it had a peace sign on the back of it, right on the back on the emblem. And I thought we'd left that long behind us, but evidently not so. All peace. The God of peace gives us ultimate peace no matter what is going on. Doesn't mean it's always happy. Doesn't mean it always feels good. I'm not saying that. But I am saying we can still exhibit peace and encounter peace because we have joy, because we know the God of all hope. And he never calls us to something that is not possible to be fulfilled by him. Never. I remember Dave and his family sharing the story of when they were on a plane. How many years ago? I don't remember. 2007. 2007, they were on a plane and landing gear would have come down, if I recall right. Um, and they were on a plane landing in Denver landing in Denver. And I remember the story from the family about how it was incredible to look around the plane and be able to see in people based on their reactions about who really understood their security in Christ Jesus. Because although it was a dire circumstance and that plane was going to land without a front wheel, you know, without it working right, it was the front, right? I mean, there was going to be a serious situation going on. And the family was able to have peace. Not that it wasn't nerve wracking. Not that it wasn't concerning. Not that it wasn't even alarming. But there was joy and peace in the midst because that's what a filling of the Holy Spirit results in. And those who do not encounter God when they face circumstances like that, panic. And I know we're capable of panicking too. I get that. I get that. But if we're walking filled with the Spirit, we won't do so. We will handle a scenario right And we can. Because the God of all hope fills you with all joy and peace in believing. And here's the key. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the dunamis, the dynamite, literally, of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. In all hope. The God of hope gives us all 
peace, gives us all joy through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we might be overflowing, abundant in hope. How cool is that? How good is that? Anybody battling a little hopelessness from time to time? Feeling a little down, out in your struggles, in your daily life? I get it. But I also get, but I also get this. That my God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to fill me with joy and peace in the midst of any circumstances, any trials, any situation that's going on. None of it's out of His control. And I am going to abound, overflow, in all hope. That is what He's given to us. That is what He's blessed us with. And He's blessed us with that in the midst of our diversity. And we can have unity in the midst of our diversity because we doctrinally believe the same things and we're going to extend grace to one another even when our preferences differ. We're going to love one another enough to confront one another when we're walking in sin and we are going to remain unified because unity is a demonstration of maturity. Of maturity. I want to leave us with six points that I believe we've learned over the last three uh, chapters of the book of Romans. There is no place for judging fellow believers on disputable matters of faith or preferential matters of faith. That's where at the beginning of the last chapter, it says we can't judge one another on disputable matters, preferential matters. If they're not sinful, we don't have to judge each other. We extend grace to one another. We can have discussions about those things. We can walk through them together. But it doesn't mean my way is the only way. It doesn't mean my way is the only right way. Either is yours. Every Christian is a servant of God and is answerable only to Him ultimately, although we give answer to one another in community living. Trust the Holy Spirit to work in one another's life. In the same mean, in the same circumstance and situation, trust God through the Holy Spirit to lead you into one another's lives, that we might minister to one another. When our lifestyle choices cause another to stumble, we should put our neighbor's good above our own choice. When our lifestyle choice causes another to stumble, we should put our neighbor's good above our own choice. Unity, which is only a kingdom value, is more important than any individual's preferences. Unity. How does the scripture say they who don't know Christ will come to know him? Anyone? By what? By love. By our love, one for another. That's how the Bible says they will want to see Him. They will want to know Him. By our love, one for another. We can't love one another rightly if we don't spend time with one another. We can't love one another rightly if we're critiquing and criticizing one another in preferential matters. We can't love one another rightly if we don't spend time together. Choices that are not from faith are sin. In our last chapter, it very clearly said that. That which is not of faith is sin. Don't cross your conscience. It's a tool given by God in order for you to stand firm. Last one. We are to serve one another for the sake of unity following Christ's example. He was the ultimate servant. Gave up his rights, the rights of all of heaven, to come and serve us at the point of the cross in order to redeem mankind. That's how Christ served. And my question to us tonight is how are we serving one another? How are we loving one another? How are we extending grace to one another? How are we sharing life with one another. Key phrase there, one another. Open up the Bible and read in the New Testament all of the one another commands. And then evaluate through that and through the unity you're promoting your level of maturity. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for your loving kindness, for your faithfulness, for your grace, and for your mercy. I thank you that you are good all of the time. And that your love for us is rich all of the time. 
and that you as the God of all hope have extended us all joy and all peace in the midst of any circumstance we face so that we might overflow and abound in hope which comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be a people that truly walks filled with the Holy Spirit so that we might minister properly one to another and so that through our love of one another we might take the message of you and the forgiveness of sin which only comes by you to all of the lostness in the world that surrounds us. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I know we had a prayer event this morning.